If this were a camera, it would mean developing multiple pictures from the film that has all the shadows from the wires on it and the hole going right through it, photoshopping all of them and combining multiple images until you get one usable image that more or less represents reality, but information has been lost. This is a cumbersome, imperfect process for a supposedly infallible creator to have come up with. One would think that God could do better. And God did. Here is a picture of God's favorite. <laughs> it's a cuttlefish. It and its relatives, squid and octopi, have eyes with retinas that are built far better than ours. They see better, farther, and in dimmer light than we do. They can also see polarized light, which we can't do at all. So, does this designer like cuttlefish better than humans? Now take a look at that beautiful eye, so much like ours, but wired so much better. And then look at these drawings. Here are diagrams of the human eye and the cephalopod eye. Cuttlefish are a type of cephalopod. They don't have backbones. Notice how the wiring that takes the visual information from the photoreceptors to the optic nerve is located behind the photoreceptors in cephalopods, but between the photoreceptors and the light in humans. As I said earlier, this is like having the wiring for a camera placed between the lens and the film. It makes no sense if our eyes had been designed, but from an evolutionary standpoint, it makes sense because it works well enough and does us more good than harm. However, I should point out that the standards for evolved features can go even lower than that. Sometimes the only standard they need is that they don't kill us before we reproduce too often. So let's move on to one of our least desirable features, the human appendix. Here it is, the human appendix, or the vermiform appendix if you're a scientist. It's an odd part of our digestive system, and it's particularly odd because it doesn't actually digest anything. In fact, it doesn't do anything useful. Even Gray's anatomy calls it a functionless organ, and Gray's anatomy is not known for its sense of humor. Having an organ that performs no particular function is bad design. The appendix is a blind sac in which bacteria grow. In fact, it's a blind sac off of another blind sac called the cecum. A blind sac off of a blind sac is the perfect place for a bacterial colony. In rabbits and other creatures that digest woody plants, the bacterial colonies that grow in the cecum and appendix can help the animal to digest wood. Humans don't digest wood. We have the organs for it, but they don't work. Having an organ in humans that works best in rabbits is bad design. Unfortunately, the appendix is still a great place for bacteria to breed. So every now and then, a colony of really nasty bacteria gets going in the human appendix. When this happens, the appendix gets a lethal infection called appendicitis, and it must be surgically removed. If it is not removed, the person dies. Having an organ that performs no particular function and occasionally kills you is really bad to something. Each year, 500,000 people in the United States suffer from appendicitis. In the days before decent surgical techniques, people died regularly from infected appendixes. Since the appendix performs no valuable function in humans, and its only effect in existing is to occasionally kill us at any age for no reason, it's not clear why an infallible creator would give us one. It's also hard to see why a creator making us in his image would give us an organ that works best in rabbits. However, seen through the lens of evolution, the appendix is easier to comprehend. It's a vestigial organ. That is, sometime in our past, 
the appendix performed a useful function. And a functionless trace of that old, previously useful appendix is still with us today. Because it's not detrimental enough to kill us before childbirth most of the time. This is also the reason why we still have tails. We don't use them, but our ancestors did. And a little trace of a tail is still with us. This is also why we have gills during prenatal development. Again, we don't use gills. But somewhere in our ancestry, some animal did, and that little functionless trace is still with us. In case you don't believe me, I have pictures. This is an adult female pelvis. You're looking at the left-hand side, and there at the back, you can see the tail. That's the sacrum and the coccyx, the end of our vertebral column. And this or these are the stages of embryonic development in many different species. We all go through the same stages, including the stage where we've got gel slits. So this is why an appendix can exist in an evolved animal, but shouldn't, in a well-designed one. One textbook I found, however, offered an alternative explanation. <laughs> so perhaps God writes the surgeon's best. <laughs> so there you have it. I've given you five simple examples of how the human body is badly designed. I could have chosen hundreds. If I had looked at the rest of nature, I could have chosen thousands. But now I want to talk about beauty. I want to point out that the human body is actually wonderful. It's just that it's wonderful in the weird, crazy way that evolved systems are wonderful, rather than being wonderful in the careful, mathematical way that design systems are. There's real beauty here, but not design. I think that our bodies are beautiful the way they are, regardless of their imperfections. I also think that there is real beauty in our ability to think, do research, and really understand the world we live in, rather than just making up stories. This capacity allows us to understand atoms and molecules that we can't even see, and principles we can't see that allow airplanes to fly, electrons we can't see that light up electric light bulbs, and yes, evolution, which often takes eons to occur, so no one human being can see it working, but we understand it, and we can make successful predictions based on it. So we know it's there. Intelligent design does not make predictions. Evolutionary theory does. The evolution of antibiotic-resistant bacteria can only be understood by evolutionary theory. Antibiotic-resistant bacteria are now killing people we used to be able to cure. I fear having public health officials who don't believe in evolution. Ecology, that is the interplay between different plants and animals and their environments, can only be understood if you understand evolution. I fear having environmental policy made by people who don't believe in evolution. I realize that in making my presentation to this audience, I am probably preaching to the choir. But there are times when this is exactly the right thing to do. Remember, this is a political argument. In fact, my main hope for this talk this evening is that I've given you, the choir, some great new songs to sing. Thank you.